Today on the Plumes of Oz we would like to present to you the lorikeets of Australia. In the mid-1800s, Alfred Wallace, a renowned British explorer and naturalist, explored through the Malay Peninsula down towards Indonesia. When he crossed over into Ambon, he heard there the screeching of parrots. He recognised the coconut lorikeet, previously described by John Latham in 1771. Wallace immediately recognised why they were called lorikeets, for the locals were calling them lorry. Wallace, being familiar with the Australian parrots, thought that it was a variant of the rainbow lorikeet, though it is now considered a separate species. What really astounded Wallace as he came down towards PNG was the variation of the lorikeets. And in 1864, in the Proceedings of the Zoological Society, wrote an excellent article that is still used as the basis of classification of parrots today. Over the last six years in Australia, we have had drought conditions. But now with the rains in 2020, the grasses are bearing seed. Trees have buds that are now coming into blossom. And it is this seed and this blossom that the parrot group will feed on. The lorikeets are canopy feeders, so they will spend most of their time in the blossom. They will occasionally eat seed, but this is fairly rare. The exception is the rainbow lorikeet. Just listen to the screeching in this northern bloodwood. There is a lot of blossom and a lot of birds feeding on the nectar. Lorikeets are highly coloured small parrots with short tails and they specialise in feeding on nectar. The question is where do they sit taxonomically? Here is our current taxonomic classification of the Cytocines. Lorikeets belong to the order Cytosoidae and make up a tribe called Lorinae. Here we have a modified chronocladogram showing the time on the bottom and on the right we have the various clades. Clade development is dependent on isolation and with continental drift different land masses became isolated. The greater development of lorikeets happened in New Guinea and Australia. From there they have radiated out into Indonesia and Oceania. The question now is what defines a lorikeet? They are very colourful and mostly have a short tail, but the most important thing is the tongue. In 1827 a paper was published defining lorikeets. This was done after research into the specimens in the Linnaean Society and the British Museum by two authors, Vigors and Horsfield. Here is an extract from the paper, and the defining thing of a lorikeet to them were the hairs on the tongue. The underpart of the tongue is furnished at the apex with numerous strong hairs or bristles of a brush-like structure and which seem to serve the bird for the purpose of suction. Sticking to birds in the wild, here I demonstrate the papilla on the tongue of this varied lorikeet. As you can see they are quite brush-like. In addition they are erectile. So when the tongue goes over a high sugar content, these filiform papillae will increase in length so harvesting of pollen and nectar becomes more efficient. Let us now look at some of the Australian lorikeets in more detail. The first one we're going to look at is the little green fellow. See the way he moved up into the leaves? He moves into camouflage. And where there is one lorikeet, so there are many. This is the scaly breasted lorikeet found on the east coast of Australia. The predominant colour in all lorikeets is green and with this colour they camouflage well in the leaves as they search amongst the canopy for nectar. The binomial name for the scaly breasted lorikeet is Trichoglossus chlorolepidosus. Always think it strange with classical naming of birds where there is a combination of two languages as we have here mainly Greek and Latin. But let's analyse this with the genus name Trichoglossus. Trico is for hair, glossus is for tongue. And then with the species name Chlorolepidotus. Chloro is for green and Lepidotus is for leaf. So in other words, hairy tongue, green, leaf, like bird. To finish up on the scaly-breasted lorikeet, here is a pair pruning at a nest hole. 
Now moving out of Lake Macquarie, a little bit further north to the northern tablelands, another lorikeet. But it is so much easier to see than the scaly breasted bird because it has red flashes over the forehead and behind the eye. And look, the cap has a blue coloration. The red coloration is on the forehead and also behind the eye. Then if you look at the crown of this bird, there is a little bit of bluish coloration, turquoise. This bird is the musk lorikeet. So called musk because it has a musky odour to it. The species name for the musk lorikeet is Glossocita consina, and here the consina implies beauty. When observing lorikeets feeding, they always appear to be in a frenzy. Their zygodactylic feet walking up stems onto the sprigs to lick the nectar. On average, I find that lorikeets feed on three flowers per second. The metabolic rate of lorikeets, I suspect, is one of the highest of all the parrots. These birds, because of their addiction to nectar sugar, show a metabolic rate reflective of their diet. These birds do roost somewhere. I've never found a roosting site. Of an evening, they go quiet, fly off to roost, never to be heard of until the next morning. As they fly, it's usually well above the canopy, looking for trees that are in flower. Another lorikeet. On this occasion we've gone back towards Lake Macquarie in the Hunter Valley. You may think it's a musk lorikeet, but look, behind the eye there is no red marking, and the face is more red, and the dimensions show that this is a smaller bird. It is the little lorikeet, or Trichoglossus persilla. Persilla meaning little, for this is the smallest lorikeet in Australia. Now you may wonder about where I'm photographing this, it's at a water point. Now it's unusual for lorikeets to come to a water point on the ground. Feeding on the nectar of flowers, they get most of their moisture content from the syrupy nectar. This may not be a total explanation, for some parrots in Australia require a lot of water and usually the parrots that do need a lot of water are eating seed. The classical example is the budgerigar, which drinks several times per day. The graniferous parrot in Australia that survives with minimal water is the princess parrot. When it does rain and seed becomes plentiful, this parrot goes into an eruptive breeding pattern. Lorikeets overall require minimal amount of water, but yet they do not go to arid zones. On the ground like this, whether feeding or drinking, they are in discomfort out of their natural arboreal environment. Even bathing for lorikeets, which is unusual, is usually done in a hollow where water has accumulated in a tree. Occasionally, rainbow lorikeets will come to the ground and chew on grass and grass seed, but I suspect that this is because the bird has been conditioned by people feeding the birds, encouraging them into their backyard. Look at the little lorikeets searching out holes in trees. Lorikeet spends considerable time playing around a tree hole. This is because it's a future nesting point. All lorikeets, like most other citizens, nest in tree hollows. When they decide on a nesting site, they will go down into the hollow trunk, chew on the base levelling it out, and the sawdust forms the basal layer for the nest. There are 13 genera of lorikeets throughout the world. In Australia, we have nine species. The defining things of a lorikeet are the magic colours, a smallish bird, small tail. The male and the female cannot be distinguished easily. And of course, the feathered tongue. The anatomy and physiology of the lorikeets is a little bit different than most of the other graniferous parrots. Firstly, the crop is much smaller. This is what accommodates the food when it's eaten. But because lorikeets are feeding on nectar, they don't need a large crop. From the crop, the food then enters the proventriculus. This is the beginning of a stomach, and the proventriculus of seed-eating birds has got a very thick muscle for the grinding up of seeds. The lorikeets don't need this thick muscle. 
the proventriculus of the lorikeets has only a very thin amount of muscle about it. The food then goes through the rest of the intestinal tract, but in the lorikeets, the whole intestinal tract is shortened. I have to presume with these little lorikeets that it is a pair. It's hard to be certain which is the male and the female, for they are isomorphic. But they are typical lovebirds doing the aloe pruning, mostly of the head. Among the citizens, there seems to be very little fighting. This is in contrast to the honey eaters. Another group of Australian nectivorous birds. I suspect this lack of aggression in the lorikeets relate to the fact that they don't need to find a partner for every breeding season. Another lorikeet, and this one has a slightly longer tail. A higher pitched call. I usually say screeching for the galahs, but this is very close. And as you can see, it is feeding on nectar. This is the red collared lorikeet of Northern Australia. The binomial name for this bird is Trichoglossus ruby torquus. Though the behavior of the red collared lorikeet is similar to the other lorikeets, it has a different appearance. Most lorikeets have a dominant green, making them hard to find amongst the canopy. But the red collared lorikeet and another lorikeet called the rainbow lorikeet have a blazing color that makes them easier to find. Now, watching it feeding on this northern eucalypt, you can see that it's chewing on the seed pods, more like a parrot than a lorikeet. But then it goes and reverts back to licking nectar from the flower. This bird has a bent tail, implying it's been sitting at a nest. I wonder whether the lorikeets do feed more seed to their young while they are in the nest. All parrots have totally dependent hatchlings. This is called altrical breeding, in contrast to many of the waders whose young can feed and act independently at hatching. The time from hatching to fledgling is also a little bit longer in parrots. This suggests that they may be more mature and perhaps more intelligent. As measured by the ability of many parrots to talk, I personally doubt this has anything to do with bird intelligence. There are several questions that are unresolved with lorikeets and indeed in general with the citizens. Firstly, the flock instinct. Many of the larger kakatuae have sentinel watches. Some other parrots like the hooded parrot use a cooperation with the wood swallows to detect raptors. Flock phenomena varies amongst the parrots, like the king parrot is usually found in pairs, whereas other birds like the large cockatoos can often be found in flocks of thousands. I have seen flocks of lorikeets up to about 50. The most dominant lorikeet on the east coast of Australia is the rainbow lorikeet, as shown here. And I suspect the flock phenomena helps this bird to be so dominant. Flocking helps for the birds to find food. Throughout this video on the lorikeets, I have stressed the importance of blossom in the diet. I'm uncertain as to the exact mineral requirements and how these birds determine what minerals to get in their diet. In the Amazon, the macaws, for instance, eat clay. Initially, this was thought to be a detoxification process, but now we understand that it's more to obtain nutrient minerals. The Australian soils are very short in mineral content, and this is reflected in the chemistry of the pollen. There are plenty of carbohydrates in the nectar and protein in the pollen, but I'm uncertain how the birds acquire minerals. Overall, I suspect there is something regionally that keeps birds in some areas that relates to this essential nutrient and flocking may help them to find it. A classic example of this can be found with a little lorikeet. Just outside of Curry Curry in New South Wales, there is an area that as soon as a blossom arrives, so does the little lorikeet. Whereas other areas, there may be the same blossom, but no lorikeets. And I suspect this area, which is called the Hunter Economic Zone, has something in the nutrient of the flower 
that attracts the little lorikeet to this area year after year. The lorikeets are altrical. When they do fledge, they generally have very close to mature colours with a little down. But notice the call of this rainbow lorikeet. It's just like a soft whistle. This is a young bird calling to the adult to be fed and naturally, like all citizens, it's with regurgitation. As mentioned before, most lorikeets aren't aggressive in their behaviour as long as they know the birds. But if a group of lorikeets come in that are not in that particular group, then they will chase them off. For our last lorikeet, we're going to head north again and look for the varied lorikeet. The varied preferentially feeds on the blossom of the northern bloodwood. With the varied lorikeet, we have a new genus name. It is Cetutiles, or Thrifty Parrot. The varied lorikeet, which is the common name, implies the variation in colour of these birds. This is the one lorikeet of Australia in which sexual dimorphism is apparent for the female is less intensely coloured than the male. One significant difference of the varied lorikeet compared to all the other Australian birds is the white periorbital eye ring and series. Just to finish off, I would like to go back and look at the blossom. It's often said the cockatoos will only chew on the seeds, but just watch this sulphur crested cockatoo. He is feeding and licking the nectar just like a lorikeet, but he does amputate the sprig first. Another citizen that's difficult to put into a taxonomic hole is the swift parrot, the fastest flying parrot in Australia. It looks like a lorikeet, beautiful greens, a little bit of red. The male and the female are virtually identical. It has a feathered tongue, like a lorikeet. However, molecular studies show that the swift parrot is not related to the lorikeets. The swift parrot is an endangered species. Fortunately, the lorikeets of Australia are doing well. I was hoping to present the purple crowned lorikeet in this video, but have only included a few still shots. The reason for this is because of the pan-endemic of the coronavirus restricting travel movements. Just watch as this musk lorikeet chases away the swift parrot. Why you may ask? It's different species competing for the same food. The last bird that I'm going to show you that you may get confused of and think that it's a lorikeet is the double-eyed fig parrot. This little beauty, though it may look like a lorikeet, feeds not on blossom but on figs and aerial seeds. Also, it doesn't have a hairy tongue. That is the end of our short video on the lorikeets of Australia. This is a review and each bird will be gradually covered separately. Click on the subscribe button if you would like to see further videos of birds in wild Australia.